of a Volkswagen Polo with a more adventurous image, a slightly larger cabin and a more flexible interior. You're picturing this car, Volkswagen's smallest SUV, the T-Cross. It's trendy, quite sophisticated and very acceptably efficient thanks to its 1 litre TSI petrol and 1.6 TDI diesel engine options. And you can make it very much your own. What's not to like? It may seem as if Volkswagen has a considerable number of family SUVs in its model lineup, but the surprising truth is that until the introduction of this T-Cross model, the Wolfsburg brand had been completely absent from one of this crucial segment's fastest growing sectors, that for super mini based SUVs. Nissan launched the Duke in 2011, Renault announced the Capture in 2014. It wasn't though until late 2018 that we first saw this T-Cross, Volkswagen belatedly responding to the fact that the small SUV segment has doubled in size over the last five years and will double again over the next five. Now this contender slots into the company's range just below the Golf-based T-Roc, which in turn sits below the Tiguan and Touareg SUVs in the company's lineup. Uh, the T-Cross is polo-based and it sits on the same MQB A0 platform as its VW Group close cousins, the Skoda Kamiq and the Seat Arona. The motor industry likes to think that customer preference for small, tall models like this one is a recent phenomenon. Actually, it isn't. Cars like the Renault 4 were offering this kind of packaging back in the 70s, although admittedly not with the kind of urban crossover vibe that characterises the T-Cross and its ilk. This doesn't translate into any actual extra rough road capability, of course. Super mini SUV buyers don't want that. But it may well sugar the pill if you've decided the time has come to downsize from something slightly larger. As will the surprising amount of space in this car's cabin. Now given the whole short tall theme you might expect this car to offer more headroom than a supposedly larger Golf but you might well be surprised to find that this T-Cross can also offer considerably more boot space than that car courtesy of its sliding rear bench and that's a key differentiating feature over this model's Seat and Skoda counterparts. Other promised surprises include the kind of brightly coloured optional trimming packs that once would have been at odds with Volkswagen's traditionally conservative image and ride quality that's equally contrary to the normal notion that because of extra height an SUV must always ride more firmly than the ordinary hatch it's based on. Well it's all enough to make us want to find out more so let's take a closer look at what the T-Cross has to offer. If, like most buyers of this model, you've decided on the 115 PS version of the 1 litre TSI petrol power plant, uh, that's what we're trying today, you might be forgiven for feeling quite hopeful here. Uh, this engine is the same one that'll royally entertain you in the brand's up GTI city car shopping rocket, and here it's bolted to an even better platform, the MQB chassis that gives the Golf such rich potential reserves of dynamic prowess. If you're T-Cross happens to be jazzily packaged, then you might think it would all add up to a little SUV that could be as fun to drive as it can be to look at. As it turns out, though, the more conservative look and feel of this particular test car is a better indicator of what you'll actually get. Perhaps predictably, this TSI engine's aural personality has been dialed down a bit for this crossover. Plus, of course, it's got 180 kilos more weight to lug about than it's saddled with in the up. The longer ratios chosen for the six-speed manual gearbox are more geared to cruising than they are to cremating the tyres. And of course, that taller body makes its presence felt if you're minded to start ambitiously pushing on at speed through tighter bends. All of these attributes will of course be very welcome to the older buyers who'll ignore the surf shack marketing and form the largest likely audience for this car and those people will love the attribute that we like most about it, the class leading quality of ride. 
Now we should have anticipated this, firstly because Volkswagen is almost always very good at supple damping and secondly because the Polo Super Mini that this car is based on is a particularly good advertisement for the brand's prowess in that respect. Uh, the company says it's set out to make the T-Cross ride like a much larger car and sure enough it does, it easily shrugs off speed humps and pockmarked urban surfaces and that's despite the lack of anything particularly advanced in terms of suspension design. Certainly many competitor brands uh, are going to want to know how a uh, straightforward McPherson strut front and torsion beam rear setup can deliver damping this good. It handles higher speed undulations brilliantly too. One writer described the response as being akin to riding on jeweled bearings. Even larger wheel sizes don't seem to upset it very much. Like most three-cylinder turbo engines, this little TSI unit doesn't have much to offer below about 2,000 RPM, so you won't be screaming away from the traffic lights. Uh, 62 mph from rest uh, occupies 10.2 seconds en route to 120 miles an hour. Once you get into the mid-range though, and you can properly use the 200 newton meter torque reserve, it becomes quite a fizzy, eager partner. Or at least it does, unless you dampen its enthusiasm by mating it to the optional seven-speed DS automatic transmission that your dealer will want to talk to you about. Uh, you can't have that self-shifter if budgetary considerations force you to have chosen this 1 litre TSI engine in its lesser 95 PS state of tune. In this feebler guise, the power plant offers 175 newton metres of pulling power, it's mated to a 5-speed manual gearbox and it labours rather more than you'd think from the quoted stats. They suggest it manages the 62 miles an hour sprint in in 11.5 seconds on the way to 112 miles an hour. Volkswagen has, rather surprisingly, also decided that this T-Cross should have a diesel engine option for our market, and that's a relatively rare thing to find in the small SUV segment. It's the 95 PS version of the brand's familiar 1.6-litre TDI unit, and it's offered in a uh, five-speed manual form, uh, a variant which makes 62 in 11.9 seconds, or with the seven-speed DSG Auto, in which case the figure is 12.5 seconds. The key stat, though, is that pulling power rises with this engine to 250 newton meters which will make the TDI derivative the T-Cross variant of choice for the few buyers who might be interested in towing light loads. But this really isn't the kind of thing you'd buy to tow stuff about, nor, as suggested earlier, is it the kind of small SUV that you'd buy if keen driving was on your agenda. Although, just in case, Volkswagen does offer an optional driving profile selection system which allows you to tweak throttle response and steering via uh, various modes. This instead is a little crossover that's perfectly suited for driving in the real world. From the moment you start off down the road in one, you instantly feel comfortable with the way it feels and responds. All the control weights are nicely matched, uh, the clutch engages smoothly, the throttle response is linear, the brakes inspire confidence, and the steering is light and precise, even if it offers relatively little in terms of actual feedback. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, during fast, tight cornering, having a slightly higher center of gravity than you get in that Polo is noticeable, but even then the T-Cross doesn't lurch about and it feels relatively agile. Um, for the rest of the time uh, you'll simply enjoy the fact that the slightly higher set driving position gives you a useful improvement in all-round visibility. So it's good around town, it's equally good out on the highway, helped by that supple ride and by standards of drive refinement that are difficult to better in the class. Uh, this car is better suited to longer trips than any other rival. But the T-Cross is at heart, as Volkswagen keeps telling us, an urban crossover. It certainly isn't intended for much use away from a paved surface, although light field tracks and muddy car parks will be slightly easier to tackle than they would be in a Polo. Four-wheel drive, well, that's fairly irrelevant in this class, but some rivals do offer enhanced traction systems for extra slippery surface grip. Volkswagen hasn't bothered with that here. Instead, this is a sensible and rather Germanic spin on what a a small SUV really ought to be and it'll almost certainly sell in considerable global numbers. If you're a loyal buyer of the brand you'll probably like it very much.
if you want a compact, affordable Volkswagen SUV, but you find the brand's Golf-based T-Rock model a bit too fashion-conscious, then this Polo-based T-Cross will probably be right up your street. Despite the fact that it sits on an MQB A0 platform, supposedly designed for super minis, it's actually not much smaller than a T-Rock in overall size, and it has a boxier, more conventional shape that ought to make it a touch more practical inside. The T-Cross is a couple of inches longer and just under six inches taller than the Polo Super Mini it's based on, but uh, that still leaves it a touch tinier than most key rivals in the segment for small SUVs. The front end does the minimum necessary to suggest crossover conformity. Uh, these squarical fog lamps in the front bumper are supposed to imbue a rugged feel, as is the grey skid plate shaped lower trimming strip that sits between them. Otherwise though, conventional Volkswagen DNA is as evident as it could be, with a bold central grille badge and chrome bands running from it into the line of the daytime running lights that are integrated into the headlamp units. Uh, from the side, the swept back profile of the T-Rock is replaced here by a much squarer, nuggety three-box shape, emphasised by two mid-level crease lines. There's a sharply defined one that flows through the door handles and a slightly subtler line that flows beneath, kinking up over the rear wheel arch to join the upper line in the rear light cluster. A lower crease gives the flank some shape and it separates arches, housing rims ranging between 16 and 18 inches in size. Uh, we've got the 18 inches here. Crossover cues include the black plastic cladding for the wheel arches and the lower sill panels, plus the roof rails, which come as standard, providing you avoid entry level trim. It's all fairly conformist, but if that's not your cup of tea, then there is the opportunity to jazz up your T-Cross to such an extent that no one will notice the fundamentals of its design are about as trendy as a day out at the Natural History Museum. Fancy energetic orange paint or bamboo garden green coloured alloy wheels? Well, no problem, get box ticking. In truth, the extrovert wheel colouring looks a bit gaudy, but we think the brighter body colour options rather suit this car well, particularly flash red and McKenna turquoise. That's a kind of minty green. The rear sports the industry's favourite stylistic device at the moment, a full-width reflector bar connecting the lamp clusters. Volkswagen calls it a heck blender. Uh, lower down, there's another grey skid plate shaped trimming strip, while a neat roof spoiler embellishes the top of the rear screen uh, with a bee sting aerial angling itself out of the roof panel just beyond. Okay, let's take a seat at the wheel. Now, as you get in, you notice an elevated hit point, which makes this car feel bigger than the Super Mini it's based on. And inside, it feels a more substantial kind of small car too. That feeling's aided by the kind of slightly raised driving position that you'd probably hope for from this kind of model, but you don't always get. Uh, you're positioned 100 millimeters higher than you would be in a Polo, and certainly higher than you would be in something comparable like, a, say, a Tirona or a Kia Stonic. You might also hope for a more interesting kind of cabin than the average small hatch would deliver. Well, that isn't on offer here, or at least it isn't if you stick with a standard spec level like this one anyway. The optional design packs that you'll need to change uh, the alloy wheel covering to either black, orange or green also deliver more fashionable finishes for the upholstery, uh, for the dashboard and the centre console. Cool turquoise, bright orange and high gloss black finishes are all on the menu and there are a list of permitted colour combinations to prevent you from going too wild. Here, as you can see, we've got nothing like that, probably reflecting the fact that the majority of T-Cross buyers are more likely to be using this car for a trip to their garden centre than to their local surf shack. Now, unless you count these rather curious lizard-style decorative inserts, the cabin style here is less hip and more hip replacement. Uh, you can't deny that the ergonomic layout is almost perfect, though, and everything falls to hand beautifully, but you might hope that the switch to the SUV genre would have given the designers a bit more license to fashionably embellish the standard polo cabin template or at least if not that they could have at least not diluted it which is what's happened here uh, there's a greater preponderance of scratchier cheaper plastic than you get in that volkswagen super mini particularly along the top of the dash here which lacks the soft rubberized surfacing that characterizes the upper part of the polo's fascia Fortunately, there are distractions to lift the grey, rather sombre atmosphere that pervades if you've not felt the need to splash out on a design pack. 
All models get this eight inch center dash composition media infotainment screen. We'll get to that in a moment, but this particular car also has the extra cost 10.25 inch active info display screen. That's a standard feature only with top R line trim, which replaces all the usual conventional dials that you'd otherwise get in the instrument cluster. Now this is based on Audi's virtual cockpit technology and it offers lots of configurable options, starting with the choices offered by this steering wheel view button here. This enables you to choose between three layouts. You can have a central information section flanked either by twin virtual dials or angled info section readouts, or you can expand that central information section to show full screen, which looks particularly eye-catching when it showcases 3D mapping. Uh, you change what appears in the middle of the layout by using uh, these steering wheel scrolling buttons as well as navigation. There are options to view audio and phone settings, uh, driving data and information on the various assist systems. And that's just the start of the configurable possibilities here. You can customize what appears within the dials and info sections which flank that central layout by using an instrument cluster option offered by the car section of this 8-inch center dash composition media monitor we just mentioned. Now, depending on how you choose to set up the active info display, you can get gauges showing range, distance info, a compass, altitude, audio, acceleration info, uh, consumption, driving distance, traveling time, or route guidance data. It's really neat. If you view all of this as information overload, then you'll want to limit yourself to this central composition media screen's more conventional features. Now, unfortunately, there's no lower rotary infotainment controller, such as you would get on, say, a Mazda CX-3 in this segment, so you'll have to stab away at the touchscreen unless you happen to have paid Volkswagen extra for voice control. Uh, shortcut buttons flanking the main display help here, and in this case, you get the two physical knobs that larger Volkswagen Group infotainment screens unwisely do without. As a result, it's really difficult to fault the functionality on offer. This uh, classy monitor delivers all the usual informational telephone and entertainment options with assured cleverness, and it offers the usual pinch and swipe screen activation if you need that. Our only comment would be that the standard six-speaker DAB audio system lacks a bit of clarity and punch, and that's not much improved by upgrading to the optional 300-watt beat setup. Avoid entry-level trim and you also get the Volkswagen CarNet App Connect setup that you'll need for Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. Now, once that software is activated, you're all set to enjoy things you maybe never thought you'd be able to access on the move. Uh, for example, Apple CarPlay supports Spotify, the music streaming service, uh, the video calling app Skype and Stitcher, which offers a variety of radio shows and podcasts. Android Auto works with a variety of apps, including Instant Messenger's WhatsApp, app and kick and google hangouts too if you get a variant fitted out with the discover navigation system we have here you also get a brilliantly helpful carnet guide and inform setup which gives you in-car online access to a whole range of useful journeying information everything from traffic news weather and news feeds to information on fuel and parking prices in your place of destination now this is included with the navigation package for the first three years of ownership and then it's offered on a subscription basis. Uh, now with this setup you can also download a Volkswagen media control app which will allow remote control of the infotainment system via phone or tablet so your kids in the back can select your journeying music. Come to think of it you might want to keep that particular feature to yourself. Enough on infotainment, what else might you need to know about the front cabin of this T-Cross? Well, headroom's generous and getting comfortable is easy thanks to the wide range of adjustment available for the seat and this three-spoke steering wheel. Uh, the seat height adjustment in particular can be varied by a huge amount. Uh, these chairs could do with a bit more side support, but we were pleased to find that they feature lumbar support as standard. And that fits with this car's uh, general aptitude as a first choice small SUV for longer trips. As for visibility, well, the thin front pillars mean a largely unobstructed view forward at junctions, but as with a number of cars in this segment, thick rear pillars obscure your over-the-shoulder view, which is a problem because rear parking sensors are standard fit only on the top two trim levels. Moving to practicalities, well, there's most of what you'd expect, uh, like this usefully deep 
forward compartment ahead of the gear stick with a 12 volt port and twin USBs nearby and twin cup holders that sit alongside the thankfully conventional handbrake. Further back, this small deep box lacks any media connection points, but it features a ratcheting top that makes it ideal as an elbow rest. Uh, there's no overhead compartment for your sunglasses. Uh, this tray on top of the dash is too shallow to be good for much. And the glove box is taken up mostly by media equipment and by the handbook. But the door bins are deep. A big bottle of water will easily fit. Uh, there's a ticket clip on the driver's sun visor. Uh, coat hooks are provided on the B pillars. You get a tray beneath the passenger's chair. And there's a proper slide out drawer here beneath the driver's seat. As we suggested earlier, the quality of cabin materials isn't up to golf standards. It's not just the grade of plastic either. Some of the panels sound rather hollow when you tap them. But the way it's all been screwed together by the Spanish Pamplona factory is difficult to fault. Let's take a seat in the rear. Now that uh, taller shape we referenced earlier is obviously going to help with entry and exit here. There's actually significantly more roof height than you'll get with Volkswagen's supposedly much larger Golf family hatch. And once you're inside, the benefits of that relatively lofty body continue to accrue. Six foot adults who might normally grumble at the prospect of long distance rear seat confinement in any super mini based model need have no worries about the prospect of running in this one. Uh, there'd better be only two of you though. Uh, most models in this class would struggle to accommodate three rear seated folk above school age, but in this one, that'd be even more difficult thanks to this uh, particularly prominently high center transmission tunnel. It's the kind of thing that you'd think you wouldn't need in an exclusively front-driven car. Uh, on the plus side, though, we appreciate the theatre-style seating design, which sees those in the back of this car perched around 50 millimetres higher than those at the front, so as to provide a better view of the road ahead. Uh, don't underestimate the importance of that kind of thing to your travelling offspring. They will additionally value the fact that beyond entry-level trim, twin USB ports are provided as standard back here. We should also mention this car's party piece, its sliding rear bench, which is standard fit across the range. Now, this feature isn't unique in the class. Renault's Capture has offered it for years, but it's still unusual to find in the small SUV segment, and it's clearly there to be a useful point of differentiation between this Volkswagen and its otherwise near-identical close cousins, the Seat Arona and the Skoda Kamiq. Uh, the seat base slides over a range of 14 centimetres, although in its uh, most forward position, legroom is virtually non-existent unless the people in front were very short indeed. Um, when it's pushed all the way back though there's vastly more legroom than you'd ever expect a car of this size would be able to provide. Um, if we were being picky then we'd want the sliding seat base to be segmented so that you could uh, say slide a baby and a child seat closer to you at the front while allowing a rear seated adult to stay back and get decent legroom. It is also a pity that the seat backs don't recline although uh, perhaps that's asking a bit much of a car in this class. As for the sensible stuff, well, since most super minis don't give you a centre rear armrest, uh, you don't get one here either. But there is a central storage cubby, uh, very decently sized door bins, and ice fix mounting points for the two outer seating positions. Uh, there are also seat back pockets, which you can't always take for granted that you'll get in this class of car. Uh, most Seat Arona variants don't provide them, for example. Finally, let's take a look at luggage space out back. Now you might hope that the tall shape would free up considerably more boot capacity than you get in a Polo. Well, that depends on the position of that sliding rear bench. If it's pushed all the way back as it is here, there's 385 litres of space, just 34 litres more than a Polo, but easy enough for a buggy or a few large suitcases. If, however, you were to push the bench right forward, then capacity would rise to 455 litres, and that's 10 litres more than you'll get in Volkswagen's T-Roc SUV from the next class up. When it slid right forward though, a significant gap in the floor is left into which uh, smaller items might fall. 
The loading area offers a set of four body colored tie down points along with two bag hooks. And it's also a very usable space thanks to this adjustable height boot floor. Now this is standard above entry level trim, but do bear in mind that you'll have to do without it if you order the optional Beats audio system because of the space occupied by the rear subwoofer. Anyway, it's easy to flip between the two levels and when you raise the thing, it clips up into place behind neat side catches. And when it is up, a deep, uh, a uh, spare wheel well is revealed below. Unfortunately, it won't contain a spare wheel unless you pay extra for one. And that's something that we always disapprove of in any vehicle purporting to be an SUV. Usefully, there's also enough room under here to take the rear parcel shelf when that's not in use. Need more room? Well, this car can't offer versatile options like a ski hatch, 40-20-40 seat folding flexibility or a fold flat front passenger seat. So there's just the usual 60-40 uh, split rear bench. Push the back wrist forward and although you won't get a completely flat floor, it will be fairly level back to the boot lip if the adjustable height floor is in its raised position. As for total capacity, well, a 1,281 litre load space is revealed if you load to the window line. That's 156 litres more than you get in a Polo and just 9 litres less than you'll get in a T-Rock. T-Cross pricing starts from around £17,000 and ranges up to around £27,000 across four core trim levels, S, SE, SEL, which is what we have here, and R-Line. Every model available is front-driven. Around half of all sales will be to private buyers. Now, almost all T-Cross models will be ordered with the 1-litre turbo TSI power plant we're trying here, which in base 95 PS form comes only with 5-speed manual transmission. And that's a combination that you have to have if you go for the base S-level trim. Uh, the next level up, SE, is the only one that gives you a choice of all three available T-Cross engines. Uh, so there's a modest £750 premium to get the perkier 115 PS version of the 1-litre TSI unit that we're trying here. Or if you're prepared to find nearly two and a half thousand pounds more over the cost of that base petrol unit and take your spend to well over 21,000 uh, pounds, then you'll be able to get yourself the 1.6 litre TDI diesel, which only 5% of buyers are expected to choose. Hence, Volkswagen's rather surprising decision to offer it in our market here. Uh, the 115 PS petrol engine comes as standard with a six speed manual gearbox. Uh, the diesel, that gets a five speed speed stick shift and with both those engines you can pay £1,500 extra to upgrade yourself to the brand's usual 7-speed DSG auto transmission. Now, since essentially this is an SUV version of Volkswagen's Polo Super Mini, it's relevant to consider the T-Cross price premium over that car. And that's an issue that the brand has tried to cloud by giving this crossover a slightly different range of trim designations and a different output for the base diesel unit. Uh, crunch the numbers and you'll find that at the foot of the range, uh, the step to go from a Polo to uh, a comparably specified T-Cross varies from around 2,300 pounds to around £3,300 depending on the variant that you're looking at. No wonder the mainstream brands are piling into this segment. Uh, as for the price difference between this car and the next SUV up in Volkswagen's range, the T-Roc, well again, um, a direct comparison that's rather difficult to make uh, because the engine range on offer in the T-Roc is slightly different but the 1 litre TSI 115 PS unit is shared and with that fitted and with a comparable level of trim, a T-Roc, that will cost you just over £2,100 more than a T-Cross. On to the value proposition offered by T-Cross pricing in the small SUV segment. Now, as usual, for proper comparisons, you'll need to be comparing apples with apples by looking at B-segment super mini-based SUVs rather than the C-segment family hatchback-based crossovers that Volkswagen targets with that larger T-Roc model. In other words, uh, if it makes more sense, cars in the Nissan Duke segment rather than the Nissan Qashqai class. Now, having mentioned the Duke, why don't we start our 
other comparisons there. And we'll also consider the rival model who's engineering that Nissan shares, Renault's Capture. Now, in both cases, the range entry-level figure seems lower than it is for this VW. But if in your Duke or Capture you want an engine that's reasonably comparable in price and performance to the one-litre TSI unit that most will choose in a T-Cross, then you'll find uh, that the pricing against this Volkswagen, although it is still more affordable, will be much more comparable. Now you could have exactly that one litre TSI engine if in this class you chose either of this T-Cross model's two direct VW Group cousins, the Seat Arona and the Skoda Kamiq. There's not much of a price difference between these three cars at the very bottom of the range, but if you're looking at, say, the one litre TSI auto package or a diesel, you could easily find that having it in the Seat or the Skoda would save you 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. But then you might have to miss out on key equipment items. Most notably, Notably, this VW's useful sliding rear bench, which you can't have even as an option on an Arona or a Kamiq. A T-Cross will hold its value slightly better too. As for other key rivals, well, most comparably equipped versions of the Ford Echo Sport cost about the same as a T-Cross, but the Echo Sport is smaller in size and it isn't as good to drive as this Volkswagen. Uh, comparably priced Korean contenders in the segment, uh, the Kia Stonic and the Hyundai Kona, they also struggle to match this Volkswagen's practicality and drive dynamics. Suzuki's Vitara and Mitsubishi's ASX feel slightly better in this regard, but they won't save you much in the most mainstream comparable guys. Uh, you might be more taken with the various PSA group models plying their trade in this sector, the Peugeot 2008, the Citroen C3 Aircross or the Vauxhall Crossland X. Volume versions of the Peugeot and the Vauxhall, which also both cost about the same as this VW, uh, can be rather bland. But the spacious C3 Aircross is tempting and it would be more so if it were better built and its looks were less of an acquired taste. Base versions of the Citroen can look attractively priced, but again, if you match apples with apples, which in this case would mean matching the least expensive turbo petrol C3 Aircross model with a base T-Cross 1 litre TSI, then you'd find that the French model's price advantage would become pretty negligible. Uh, Fiat's contender, the 500X, will also cost you more if you reject it in its slow, inefficient base 1.6 litre petrol form and instead choose an engine more comparable with the performance and frugality you get with the Volkswagen's TSI technology. And you could easily find yourself paying in the region of about £1,500 more than this German brand's asking here if you were to go for a comparable version of a segment rival like Vauxhall's Mocha X, uh, Jeep's Renegade, Suzuki's SX4 S-Cross or Mazda's CX-3. Uh, of course, there are cheaper, small SUVs in this class from the real bargain brands that would save you decent money over a T-Cross. Uh, Sangyong's Tivoli, for example, that could save you up to around £3,000 or more, although the price gap will be much reduced if you equip the Tivoli to the level of this Volkswagen. And much of the price difference that then remained uh, would be eroded over the duration of your ownership period by the Sangyong's higher running costs and lower residuals. Broaden the scope of your search and you could even theoretically get yourself a comparable car of this kind in the really affordable 12 to 14,000 pound bracket if you went for a Suzuki Ignis, which is too small for family use, or a Dacia Duster. That's a much clunkier proposition though for urban driving. But let's get to the bottom line here, which is that whatever you pitch it against, uh, the value proposition of this Volkswagen will probably end up looking pretty strong, especially once you've taken its strong, likely residual value performance into account. If, having considered all this, you conclude it is a T-Cross that you really want, then you're going to need to know just how generous Volkswagen's been when it comes to standard specification. Uh, and the answer is that they'll probably be more included than you might expect, although it does seem a bit mean to make base spec variants do without basic fundamentals, like the variable height boot floor and the alarm. Unfortunately, you have to progress further up the range to get those, Otherwise, though, uh, most of what you want is included, uh, even on the humblest S-Spec model. Uh, this base variant comes with air conditioning, 16-inch alloy wheels, and the decent tally of safety kit that we'll talk you through in a minute. But the specification highlight is Volkswagen's composition media infotainment system with its smart glass-fronted 8-inch touchscreen. Uh, from this, you activate a six-speaker DAB audio system, Bluetooth phone connectivity, plus USB, SD card, and aux-in connection points. 
Plus, there's Volkswagen Connect Media Connectivity, which uses what the brand calls a data plug to send vehicle information via Bluetooth to a Volkswagen Connect app, which you can freely download to your smartphone. Now, once you've got that up and running, uh, you'll have constant access to information on your T-Cross, uh, things like its fuel level, its current mileage, and when the next service is due. Uh, you'll be able to analyze your driving style, monitor fuel consumption, plan forthcoming trips, uh, uh, seek out parking spaces wherever you are and use a 24-hour customer helpline. Most buyers, though, are going to want to try to stretch to an SE variant if only to get a wider choice of engines and extra cost options. Uh, now, you have to stretch to this level in the range to get a standard, at least some elements of the advanced degree of media connectivity that Volkswagen is making so much of with this car. Uh, SE spec customers uh, get the CarNet App Connect system, which allows use of the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto MirrorLink systems. Those enable you to mirror the display of your smartphone on onto the centre dash screen. All SE models also get 17-inch Clayton alloy wheels, roof rails, adaptive cruise control, twin USB connection points, auto headlamps and wipers, an auto dimming rear view mirror, a front centre armrest and leather for the steering wheel and the gear knob. Plus the uh, variable height boot floor and the alarm which is missing from the base spec. So there you have it, SE spec gives you pretty much everything you really need in this Volkswagen. Still, there'll surely be customers seduced by the big car feel who'll want more. And for them, the really desirable variants beckon. Uh, let's start with the upper spec SEL trim level that we're trying today. Here again, you get 17 inch alloy wheels, but they're of a smarter Chesterfield design. Plus there are full LED headlights, silver roof rails, rear tinted glass, and all round parking sensors. Inside, an SEL spec model gives you sports seats, carpet mats, uh, two-zone climate control. Uh, the main spec feature at this level, though, is the improvement of the composition media system to discover navigation status. And that uh, not only means you get satellite navigation, but you also get a three-year subscription to the useful CarNet Guide and Inform package. With this, you get constantly updated journeying information on things like traffic flow, fuel prices, weather forecasts, and news reports. Having the Discover Navigation setup means you can also download a Volkswagen Media Control app, which will allow remote control of the infotainment system via your phone or tablet. If you want a plusher T-Cross with a really sporty look and feel, R-Line trim could suit with its R-Line styling pack, body-coloured side skirts, black wheel arch extensions, aluminium look pedals and striking 18-inch Nevada alloy wheels. At this level, you also get an R-Line branded steering wheel, race decorative dash inserts, black roof lining, steering wheel paddle shifters for the DSG Auto gearbox, if you've specified that, and most significantly, the big 10.25-inch active Info instrument binnacle display screen with its virtual dials. On to options, and bear in mind here that not many of the things that we're going to talk about will be available to you if you opt for base S trim. Okay, uh, where to start? Well, normally uh, when we're talking about extra cost features on the cars we test, we leave personalization and aesthetic embellishment until last. But here, it's so fundamental to the appeal of the T-Cross that we'll cover that immediately. Now, basically, there are three so-called design packs on offer, only available on SE or SEL models and based around black energetic orange or bamboo garden green finishes. You get 17 inch manila diamond turned alloy wheels as part of each pack on the SE variants and 18 inch cone diamond turned wheels with each pack on the SEL models. The rims are individually shaded to suit the color of the pack concerned as are the door mirror housings and dark tinted rear glass will be included if the T-Cross model that you've selected doesn't already have that. Inside the color of the pack you've chosen will also feature on the seat upholstery, the dash pad and the centre console. Now bear in mind that not all the design packs can be ordered with all the available body colours. Volkswagen has instigated a list of permitted colour combinations to prevent you from going too wild. Uh, remember too that you'll probably end up having to pay your dealer more for your choice of body colour. Uh, solid Urano grey and pure white are the only shades that come as standard. Other solid colours cost a little extra or you can go for a metallic option like the Reflex Silver that we have here. Uh, for even more there are two metallic 
metallic signature colors, champagne silver, and the gorgeous Makina turquoise as kind of mint green. If you haven't gone for a design pack and you've chosen this SEL level trim, your dealer will offer you various 17 and 18 inch optional alloy wheel designs too. We've got the 17 inch Chesterfield rims here. Uh, what else might you want to spend extra on? Well, let's start with that active info display because it's so unusual in this segment. It replaces all the conventional instrument dials with a single customizable 10.25 inch TFT display that's totally configurable. It's very futuristic and it's another of this model's biggest showroom talking points. One day, probably quite soon, all small cars will feature something like this. Now, it works best when it's fitted in conjunction with the upgraded Discover Navigation in infotainment package that I uh, already mentioned. Now that is an option on S and SE trim. A little disappointingly, whatever standard infotainment setup you have fitted to your chosen T-Cross, voice activation costs extra. Uh, once you have some sort of navigation setup fitted to this car, uh, then you'll have the chance to use Volkswagen's media control app, which uh, allows passengers to control the media system using their smartphones or tablets. So kids in the back, for example, can find their favorite radio station, and then they can respond to bellowed adult commands to turn it down. Talking of audio, plenty of T-Cross customers are going to want to consider an upgrade to the 300 watt Beats sound pack, which gives you an eight channel digital amplifier and a subwoofer in the boot. Uh, we would think twice here, the sound quality isn't vastly improved and having that package means you can't have the useful variable height boot floor and it denies you the chance to pay extra for a space saver spare wheel. Better options for any extra cash uh, would include a smartphone charging mat, uh, keyless entry and power folding door mirrors. An optional winter pack gives you heat for the front seats and for the windscreen washer jets, plus a low washer fluid warning light. And if you struggle with parking, then you can add in a rear view camera and a park assist system, which will automatically steer you into spaces. Avoid entry level trim, and you can also add in a driving profile selection system, which gives you drive modes, which alter steering feel, throttle, climate settings, and on the DSG automatic variants, gear change timings too. What else? Uh, well, on an S model, you might want to add in front fog lights, an alarm and leather for the steering wheel and the gear knob. On an SE, you might want to add full LED headlights and two-zone climate control. And on both, you might want parking sensors, rear tinted glass and carpet mats. On to safety, and this is an area where Volkswagen needs a strong showing with this model. Standard on all T-Cross variants is a front assist system that on the open road scans the road ahead as you drive for potential accident hazards, warning you if one's detected and automatically braking if necessary. And now you get the same kind of functionality at urban speeds too as part of a city emergency braking system, which is included as part of the front assist package. Now this setup also includes predictive pedestrian protection which specifically searches for pedestrians who might be just about to step out in front of you and if necessary it can initiate braking to avoid them. Uh, all T-Cross models also get twin front side and curtain airbags, ice-fix child seat fastenings, a tyre pressure monitoring system and anti-whiplash front head restraints. On top of this, there are all the usual electronic systems to try to ensure that uh, none of those features will ever be needed. That means ESC stability control and an ASR traction control system. Uh, there's ABS braking, of course. A hill hold assist feature will stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions and panic stops will be advertised to following motorists by automatically activating hazard warning lights. In addition, across the range, the Wolfsburg brand has installed a clever automatic post-collision braking system, which automatically brakes the car down to six miles an hour after a collision. So if, say, someone hits you and, understandably, you go to pieces, the car will automatically sort itself out. We're also pleased to see the inclusion of a pre-crash preventative occupant protection system, which uh, senses when an impact is imminent and then braces the car to better withstand it by instantly closing the windows. Also, 
standard is lane assist, which warns you if you drift out of your lane on the highway. It's not quite as sophisticated as the lane keeping aid you get in a Passat, which auto steers the car on a constant trajectory. Instead, lane assist here only intervenes if unintentional lane departure is imminent. Unfortunately, so as to keep Euro NCAP happy, it automatically activates every time you start the car, but it can be swiftly disabled by a couple of buttons on the steering wheel. What other safety kit is there? Well, a pan-European emergency call service alerts the rescue authorities if you're in an accident and the airbags go off. Avoid base trim and you also get a driver alert system that monitors your driving reactions to drowsiness and prompts you to stop for a restorative coffee if lethargy is detected. Plus, it's worth mentioning that all T-Cross variants fitted with navigation get traffic sign recognition, which pictures road signs as you pass them and then displays them on the centre dash screen. High beam assist uh, automatically dips your headlamps at night in the face of oncoming traffic. That's optional. Uh, other features you can have on your T-Cross include a blind spot monitor, which alerts you if you're just about to dangerously pull out to overtake when there's a car in your blind spot. And a rear traffic alert feature, which warns you of oncoming traffic when you're reversing out of a parking space. It's all very reassuring. Small SUVs have come quite a long way in recent times, most notably in terms of running cost efficiency. Not long ago, there was quite a significant gap between the fuel and CO2 readings of a little crossover and uh, the Super Mini that it would inevitably be based on. Uh, now, this was mainly down to excess weight, and that's the kind of thing that you still find with older designs in this segment. Uh, Vauxhall Mocha X, for example, weighs nearly one and a half tons. That's about 350 kilos more uh, than the level at which a decently engineered small hatch tips the scales these days. There's nothing like that here, of course, with this T-Cross, nor would you expect there to be, given the delay that there's been in Volkswagen entering this profitable class. In the typical 1 litre TSI 115 PS manual form we're trying here, this car has a curb weight of 1,250 kilos, 115 kilos more than the mechanically identical version of the Polo it's based on, which is about as slim an increment as you're likely to see in this segment. Uh, that explains why the returns of this volume T-Cross variant, 112 grams per kilometre of NEDC rated CO2, and up to 47.9 mpg on the WLTP rated combined size cycle are only slightly different from those of a comparable Polo. Uh, you'll actually do fractionally better uh, than that on CO2 if you opt for the DSG Auto gearbox, in which form the car manages 111 grams per kilometre, although the fuel figure will fall marginally to a best possible figure of 45.6 mpg. In feebler 95 PS 1 litre TSI manual form, this car manages up to 48.7 mpg and 112 grams per kilometre of CO2. Volkswagen doesn't have any plans to follow obvious rivals in offering any kind of electrified engine technology in this segment, but for those buyers who are obsessed with lowering their running cost returns, it does make available a diesel engine in this car. The 95 PS 1.6 litre TDI unit in question can't manage a huge improvement in the officially quoted stats over its petrol counterpart, but our experience suggests that its readings might be rather easier to achieve in the real world, and that's thanks Thanks to the extra torque that means you don't have to thrash the engine about so much. For a manual T-Cross TDI, uh, you're looking at up to 52.3 mpg on the combined cycle, that's WLTP rated, while for the DSG Auto, it's up to 50.4 mpg. With both transmissions, the CO2 figure is 110 grams per kilometer. The TDI power plant gets a selective catalytic reduction filter to cut down on nitrous oxide, and like most modern diesels, it uses a urea-based solution called AdBlue that's injected into the exhaust gas stream to help clean up emissions. All the engines are aided by the brand's usual blue motion technology, stop-start and brake energy regeneration systems. Um, if your T-Cross has DSG automatic transmission, then it'll also offer a coasting function that at cruising speed speeds will disconnect the gearbox from the powertrain, uh, which will leave the engine to idle until you next need it. So the technology is there, but in real world day-to-day -day ownership across the range, does it actually achieve the returns that Volkswagen's promising? 
Well, that's a fair question given the controversy in recent times over the company's quoted fuel figures. Uh, we'll answer that by suggesting that a careful T-Cross owner might be able to get close to the official stats, but only if he or she were to fully use all of the efficiency tools that this car makes available, and there are plenty of those. If, for instance, you've downloaded the free Volkswagen Connect app that comes with this car, you'll find that it includes a challenges section that sets efficiency driving targets, encouraging you to collect points and trophies with bonus challenges to improve your scores. Uh, there's also a convenience consumer section of the central media screen that shows you how much energy the climate control system is draining from the car. And plenty of driving data will brief you on your ongoing efforts of frugality. That is just the start though. Across the range, the center dash infotainment screen includes a think blue trainer in the car section, a display that gives you three circular dials that help with different areas of driving efficiency. Uh, the center one has two blue arcs in the outer ring and you have to stay within these by braking and accelerating carefully. If you do, you'll achieve a higher so-called blue driving score rated on a scale of 0 to 100 and shown in the left-hand circle or graphically via a separately selectable blue score overview. Do well here and the average fuel consumption figure shown in the right hand circle will of course rise and a touch of that round graphic will take you to a graph showing your average fuel consumption over the last 30 minutes. Now there's also the option of accessing a series of Think Blue fuel saving tips, although to be frank, some of these are rather blindingly obvious. Uh, things like take it easy and save and avoid transporting unnecessary loads. Can you be bothered with all this? Well, if you can't, there's no good complaining that the quoted running cost figures don't match those you actually achieve. The other cost-related facts surrounding this Volkswagen, though, are rather more straightforward. You can expect some of the highest residuals available in the class. Uh, independent experts reckon that a T-Cross will hold on to between 49 and 55% of its original value after three years and 36,000 miles of use. The entry-level S-Trim model is likely to perform best there. To give you some segment perspective, the figures for a rival Mazda CX-3 are 44 to 52%. Uh, for a Citroen C3 Aircross, though, you'll achieve just 39 to 44%. Uh, this Volkswagen comes with reasonable insurance groupings too. The base 95 PS 1 litre TSI model is rated at Group 8E. For the 115 PS version of that unit, it's 10E, 12E or 13E, depending on the trim level you choose. For the 1.6 litre TDI diesel, it's Group 10E or 11E. As for servicing, well, as usual with Volkswagen models, there's a choice of either fixed or flexible maintenance packages. Now, you'll be choosing the fixed approach if you cover less than 10,000 miles a year, and with this, the car will typically be looked at every 12 months. If, however, your daily commute is more than 25 miles and your T-Cross will regularly be driven on longer distance journeys, you'll be able to work with the flexible regime, which in the first two years of ownership could see you travelling up to 20,000 miles or waiting up to 24 months before a garage visit. A single inspection service every year or 20,000 miles will be required thereafter, whichever comes sooner. And warranties. Well, the standard package is three years and 60,000 miles. Uh, we really can't see why Volkswagen couldn't extend that mileage limit to 100,000 miles, since that's what uh, you get on the mechanically very similar Caddy model. Doing that, though, wouldn't, of course, give Volkswagen dealers so much of an opportunity to sell extended warranty packages. Uh, there's one for four years and 75,000 miles. Or if you plan to see a bit more of the world in your T-Cross, there's a five-year, 90,000-mile package. Whatever your decision, your car will come with three years of pan-European roadside assistance, which has no mileage restriction. Uh, the paintwork warranty lasts for three years, and as you'd expect, this little SUV is protected by a 12-year anti-corrosion guarantee. We're continually amused by the way that so-called motoring experts disdain fashion-led small SUVs like this. These people will tell you grandly that a comparable Super Mini will be cheaper to buy, better to drive, and more affordable to run. They don't, though, seem to realize what's pretty obvious to the rest of us, that in comparison to something like this T-Cross, a conventional Super Mini is about as interesting as a weekend spent creosoting your garden fence. 
A Super Mini will also be less personalizable than a crossover and less spacious inside. All of these virtues delivered by a small SUV for what these days can be a relatively small price premium. So we're not surprised at the way this segment is expanding so quickly. We did wonder quite a lot though why it took the Volkswagen Group so long to enter it. Still, the brand has taken careful note of what buyers want in this sector and it's provided the kind of more mature, polished product that up till now the class has been lacking. Now you will pay a little more for a T-Cross than you will for some obvious rivals, but what you get in return is a more considered product that restricts its frivolity to a few optional trim packages, but is at heart very much a traditional Volkswagen. There are some things we really like about it, the superb class-leading ride quality, for example, and the sliding rear bench. That's a key showroom selling point that would allow you to downsize from a family hatch into one of these and feel quite happy. Plenty of customers will. How appealing the T-Cross will be to drivers currently loyal to rival brands? Well, that's another question. If this car could have offered the interior quality and drive dynamics of a Golf, well, its task would certainly have been made easier. Uh, we also question its cutting edge credentials. Yes, there is the optional digital dash, but apart from that, it does feel in some respects like the kind of design that's been sitting on the stocks for some time. There's no doubt, though, that it's likely to carve out a useful niche for itself. Uh, you certainly have to be a committed follower of fashion to choose a T-Rock over one of these. It is, at heart, a very complete small SUV and very much a Volkswagen.